I'm Olivier Bero and I'm the founder of the Center for Governance, Risk and Regulation at the London Institute of Banking and Finance. Uh, we're developing a wide range of free resources for our website and this is episode two of what we call Risky Business, which is a series of podcasts, videos and other type of content on the topics of uh, governance, risk and regulation, highlighting um, some of the key issues that are shaping how financial firms are governed how they manage their risk and how they are regulated. And today I am delighted to uh, welcome Andrew Cunningham, who is the co-chair of our editorial board. And we're going to discuss the new standards on operational risk and operational resilience that were recently published by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision in March 2021. Andrew, hello and welcome. Um, perhaps we can start by making sure that we understand the difference between operational risk and operational resilience. Thanks, Olivia. Yes, it is important that we understand our terms before we go any further. When we speak about operational risk, we're speking about the potential losses that a bank could suffer as a result of certain events, the failure of its IT systems, a faulty internal process that allows a fraud to occur, for example. And we measure the losses that arise from such events, and we try to predict how great the losses could be in terms of their impact on earnings and capital. Operational risk forms part of the, the holy trinity of, of risks, credit market and operational risk, that are used to calculate the adequacy of a bank's pillar one capital. Now, in contrast, when we speak about operational resilience, we're speaking about the bank's ability to maintain or to restore a service after an event has occurred, an event such as a cyber attack or an IT failure. Operational resilience assumes that the bad event has already occurred and it, and it questions the impact of that event on the bank's customers and on the financial system as a whole. And when we say impact here, it's the impact of the event that has already occurred. And we're asking about the level of harm that it will cause customers and the financial system and how quickly the bank can remedy that situation. So to be clear, operational resilience is about how good you are at minimizing the impact of a disruption to your essential services. The assumption is that the event, the disruption has already happened. In contrast, operational risk is part of risk management, which tries to ensure that those events do not materialize and to quantify the likely financial impact on the bank if they do. Thank you. That is very clear, but it does sound rather theoretical. I, I wonder if we could uh, ask you to give us a practical example to illustrate the point you've just made. Yes, now let, let, let's suppose that a bank suffers a cyber attack at 6 p.m. on a Friday night, with the result that it has to temporarily stop all payments being made by customers that hold its debit cards. Now, from an operational risk perspective, this incident will lead to financial costs for the bank. It will probably have to pay premium fees to outside IT firms to resolve the cyber attack issues and get its payment systems back online. It may have to pay compensation to its customers and it may be fined by its regulator. So we're seeing this incident from the bank's perspective and specifically the ability of the bank to absorb the financial costs arising from that, in, that incident. Now, from an operational resilience perspective, the bank will have been expected to identify payments through its debit cards as a critical operation. And it will have been expected by the regulator to decide how long that service could be interrupted before there is intolerable harm, I'm using my words carefully, intolerable harm either to customers or to the financial system. Let's suppose that the bank decides that six hours is the maximum amount of time that should elapse before or could elapse before intolerable harm occurs to customers and the system. 
the bank will then be expected to have in place a plan to restore the service within six hours. So now we're not considering the costs to the bank of the incident, although of course there will be costs. What we are considering is the extent to which customers and implicitly our regulators can tolerate a breakdown of the important business services that the bank provides and whether the bank has the ability to remedy that breakdown. Thank you very much. That, that, is, that is very useful and extremely clear now that you've given us both the example and the theory behind it. But I mean, to be frank, Andrew, we've been talking about operational risk for decades. And we've always known that problems arise when critical services get interrupted. There's nothing new there. So, so why is Basel producing new standards at this juncture uh, on this subject? That's a very fair question to ask. So let's consider operational risk first. The Basel Committee has been planning to update its principles for the sound management of operational risks for some time. The last revision occurred 10 years ago and it incorporated lessons learned from the global financial crisis. Now, since then, Basel has found that many of its principles have not been well implemented. So this year's update is about implementation. It's about issues such as analytic tools that banks use to identify operational risks. It's about how to define differences between the three lines of defense. It's about the role of the board and senior management in oversight. It's about implementation. The new principles on operational risk have not been published because Basel thinks there's been a big change in the nature of operational risks themselves. Although I just should mention as a footnote that they did publish guidance on ICT risk, information communications and technology, ICT risk a few years ago. Now, switching our focus to operational resilience, now here the story is different. There is a sense that the fundamentals have changed that the risk of significant disruptions to critical services has become greater due to natural disasters, the effects of climate change, more frequent cybersecurity incidents and technology fail failures, and of course the COVID pandemic, which has forced people to think about service disruption from a completely different perspective. For example, how do you provide important banking services that previously involved face-to-face -face contact when you can't meet people face-to-face? There's another thing happening here which is important. We do need to see the heightened interest in operational resilience in the context of regulatory efforts to strengthen banking and financial systems after the global financial crisis of 2008. Implementation of the Basel III standards has resulted in banks holding far more capital and far more liquidity than in previous years. And the Basel standards, Basel III, has led to better governance and stronger risk management. So the likelihood that banks will get into trouble is less now than it was in the past, or at least that's what we all hope. But the work of the Basel Committee and national regulators and operational resilience recognizes that despite these improvements to banks' financial strength and risk management, disruptions to services will sometimes happen. And we need to make sure that when such disruptions happen and they could cause harm either to the financial sector or to the customers, they are quickly remedied. It is no longer acceptable for banks not to be able to provide vital services. They need to identify the vital services that they, the bank, is providing and ensure that if there's a disruption to those services, the disruption can be quickly fixed and the service can resume. Andrew, thanks very much. That, that is very clear. Now, if, if I think of this um, and, and put myself in the shoes of a bank director, I'm on the board and I'm thinking, what, what is the bank expected to do in this context? And, and perhaps also quite importantly, what am I as a bank director? What am I supposed to do? Let me be very clear what we expect you to do in this context as a director, Olivier. Firstly, you need to ensure that your bank has identified 
the critical services as it provides. Secondly, the bank needs to define its tolerance. And again, I'm using my words carefully. It's tolerance for the disruption of those services. And thirdly, it needs to ensure that its procedures and processes will enable it to remain within those tolerances. In simple terms, if you say that providing current accounts is a critical service that your bank provides and that it would be intolerable or harmful for current account holders to lose access to their accounts for more than 24 hours, the regulator will want to see that you have thought through how that situation could arise, that customers lose access to the current accounts in the first place. And that's going to involve more than one scenario, by the way. Okay, so how could that circumstance arise? What are the scenarios under which customers could lose access to their current accounts? And then the regulator is going to want to see that you have clear plans in place to restore the service within the tolerance that you've defined. And a really important element of all this is understanding how you provide that critical service from end to end. What are all the different pieces that together enable you to continue to provide that service? What are all the links in the chain that enable you to provide that service? And how quickly could you fix any one of those individual links if they were broken? Now I'll add that a regulator is not gonna want to see you listing hundreds of services which you decide are all essential. You should be focusing on a small number of services that are essential to your customers and the well-being of the financial system. So most obviously, ensuring that uh, the ability of your customers to use your payments cards and then to restore that service, is, service if it's disrupted, that would be an example of an essential service for a retail bank. Ensuring that customers can access their bank accounts online, that would be a, an essential service for most banks. If your bank provides payroll services to companies, that's probably also going to be an essential service. Thanks, Andrew. This is compelling and absolutely makes sense. As a bank director, again, putting myself in those uh, shoes, I wonder if a practical real life example of when a bank was caught short on this kind of uh, measurements uh, would help to bring home the point. Do you have one for us? Well, an example that is frequently cited when we talk about operational resilience is the cyber attack on Tesco Bank in the United Kingdom in November 2016. And by the way, the enforcement action that the regulator took against Tesco Bank is publicly available and it makes very interesting reading. Um, and the, the bones of what happened was that a cyber attack began at 2 a.m., London time on a Saturday morning, so Friday night, Saturday morning, 2 a.m., um, with the hackers spending money in shops, not in London, as you'll hear, hackers spending money in shops using payment card numbers that have been issued by Tesco Bank. Two hours later, so 4 a.m. that morning, it's still Saturday morning, the bank's fraud detection system started sending text messages to customers, warning them of suspicious transactions on their accounts and asking them to call a Tesco call center. That's how the bank became aware that it was under attack. Its systems were sending out text messages to customers. Now, it took the bank's financial crime operations team 21 hours to make contact with the fraud strategy team. And that fraud strategy team was the specialized group that's supposed to deal with this kind of cyber attack incident. Now, by the way, one of the reasons why it took nearly one day for them to contact the specialist department was that they sent an email to the fraud strategy inbox rather than telephoning the fraud analyst who was on call over the weekend. No one monitored the fraud strategy inbox over the weekend. I mean, to be frank, with this type of incident happening, you would have thought that they would have made a phone call rather than sending an email. And if they didn't send an email and didn't get a reply very quickly, you would have thought that they would have picked up the phone. 
And even beyond that, why wasn't the fraud strategy inbox being monitored over the weekend? Cyber criminals don't stop work at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Anyway, once the fraud strategy team had been alerted to what was going on, they worked out that the fraud was taking place in Brazil. That's the origin of it. And they put in place some software to block the transactions. That was about 24 hours after the attack first began. But then the bank noticed that the number of fraudulent transactions from Brazil was increasing. To be sure, the bank's own systems were blocking about 90% of the payment attempts, but the number of, of attempts from Brazil was increasing. And that's after the software patch had been put in place. And then they noticed that the fraud strategy team had used an incorrect code in the software patch. Instead of using a code for Brazil, they'd used the code for Europe. And it wasn't until Monday morning, about 48 hours after the attack started, that the problems were sorted out. Wow, uh, what a catalogue of disasters and, and uh, issues they had to face. I suspect that the next natural question from all this would be, what are the lessons learned that we could draw from this? Well, I mean, where, where to start? Um, but I think the, the place to start, first of all, is that Tesco was vulnerable to this type of attack because someone had got access to the numbers they used on their debit cards and had been able to replicate them. And it was also vulnerable because somehow these cards were being used for contactless payments, even though supposedly contactless payments were impossible from cards with those numbers. So you've got some uh, issues there with the, with the numbers that were being used and the security with, around those numbers. But then when the event occurred, it was not quickly fixed because the bank did not follow its own written procedures. It failed to block the attack because it coded incorrectly. And then it didn't realize that it had coded incorrectly because it didn't check that the code was working, which it wasn't. There's two, two more points to make here. Firstly, the people who messed up here were specialists. This was not, it was not that the bank didn't have cybersecurity experts on its staff, it did. The problem was that they didn't follow procedures. And in some case, to, to be frank, they didn't appear to have exercised some basic common sense. There's a second point here, a point that features very prominently in the British regulators account of what happened and the distress that was suffered by the customers. And that distress that was suffered by the customers is a significant factor in determining the penalty that was imposed upon Tesco. So Tesco systems were sending out texts asking people to call a call center because there were suspicious transactions on their account, or to be precise, suspicious transactions with a debit card number, which appeared to be connected to their account. Mm -hmm. As a result, uh, all these people were calling the call center and the call center was overwhelmed. Customers were kept on hold for hours, quite literally hours. We know exactly what happened here. They were kept on hold for literally hours and 94% of the people who called the call center gave up. They abandoned their calls, presumably because they were kept on hold for too long. Now, from a regulator's perspective, that is harm really important word in operational resilience, harm. The inability of customers to connect with the call center after they've been asked to do so in relation to suspicious transactions caused considerable stress and anxiety, harm. Very important word. Now, if you had asked Tesco about operational resilience before this incident happened, you know what they would have said, that they had a specialized fraud department except it seemed to rely on an inbox that wasn't monitored over the weekend. They had staff who were experts in their field, except they put in an incorrect code. And that they had a call center that would enable them to speak to customers, to reassure them in the event that there was a cyber attack, except the call center was overwhelmed and nearly everybody who phoned gave up. The bank in this respect was not resilient was not resilient in respect to its ability to restore services after an attack on its debit card 
operation. What the bank had not done was to adequately test from end to end. Again, it's a very important concept here to test from end to end the resilience of all the processes involved in the operation of its debit cards. That's a brilliant example. It really brings it home. And um, I have to ask, what happened to Tesco Bank after that? To their credit, they cooperated fully with the regulatory inquiry into the incident. And as a result, their fine was reduced by 30% to, to recognise that cooperation. But they, so the, the end fine on them was £16 million. Pounds. So that's um, an expensive um, 48 hours, £16 million pounds for an incident that lasted 48 hours. Yeah. And a huge amount of customer satisfaction, dis dissatisfaction and reputational damage. So in order to avoid that situation, because, I mean, it's it's... What's striking in this example is that, exactly as we pointed out, if you had asked the board, you know, the bank director that we were trying to put ourselves in the shoes of earlier on, the bank director could have said to us, if we'd asked as a regulator or anyone else, you know, we have all these things in place. Um, you know, they could have been quite reassured that they'd done the discharge their duties and had put in place the adequate appropriate system. So what, what should they do to avoid you know, falling short in spite of having done all this? So we start off by identifying the key services that the bank provides to customers and to the financial system more generally. Then we decide the maximum tolerance for disruption to those services. And then we check end to end to make sure that all of the bank's processes, all of the bank's staff training and the response time the access to additional resources in the event of an attack or an emergency, everything you've got will ensure that you're able to get those services working again in the event that they suffer a disruption. Think of all those links in the chain. If one of those links breaks, can you repair it within your tolerance? Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, once again, uh, this is a podcast that is produced by the London Institute of Banking and Finance. Uh, this was Andrew Cunningham, the co-chair of our editorial board at the Centre for Governance, Risk and Regulation. And this is part of a series called Risky Business, where we try to cover issues that are pertinent to the industry in the field of governance, risk and regulation. And today we're talking to you about operational resilience and operational risk. So Andrew, thank you very, very much. And I hope you've all enjoyed this podcast and uh, we'll be back uh, to give you some more very shortly. Thank you. <laughs>